automatic grenade launchers. But let's talk about the M2 Browning. Honestly, it's fascinating how far it got from a weapon that, let's be real, wasn't looking so promising at first. How far, you ask? So far that it is still very much used today. And get this, with only minor changes and improvements to it, we're talking the same core design from over a century ago. The most visible recent change, that was the M2A1 configuration, which gave it an improved barrel change system. Uh, a flash suppressor and a manual safety. But other than that, it's more or less the same weapon. You know, I said this about the MG42, how fascinating it is that such an old design is still kicking today in a modernized version. But when I did the research for this, I realized the Modus, it's even older. I mean, it's literally from the First World War, and it still remains an incredibly useful platform and caliber with no end in sight for either. They're even creatively mounting them on trucks to protect convoys from ambushes. And listen, for the 50 caliber gunners from the Second World War to this day, they have serious firepower in their hands, but that came with a huge cost. The enemy would do anything, and I mean anything, to get rid of them as soon as possible. So they'd pretty quickly become the center of attention. I mean, with that distinctive firing sound, the smoke, the muzzle flash, you couldn't miss them. And honestly, I don't know why, but for way too long, the early 50 caliber guns on vehicles and tanks didn't have shields to protect the gunners from small arms fire. They didn't get standardized until much later in the Vietnam War. And get this, even Humvees in more modern wars didn't have shields until horrible losses from snipers and urban combat started piling up. And then they began making turrets. And later, they introduced remote weapon stations like Crows, which totally solved this problem. So now, instead of sticking your head and upper body out to fire the machine gun, the gunner uses a joystick and a camera from the safety of his vehicle. What a game changer, right? And they're using all this advanced tech, you guys. Laser range finders, night vision, thermal views, you name it. They're even made to work not just with the 50s, but with other machine guns too. So what happens when one heavy machine gun just isn't enough? Well, you just take four of them, mount them on a single platform, and point it at anything you'd wish to. You know, cease to exist. This, my friends, is the M45 Maxim quad mount. It was originally created for mobile defense against low-flying aircraft. I mean, the 50 BMG was good for that. But here's the thing, its rate of fire was kinda low, and the gunner had a tiny window to hit a fast-moving target, so what did they do? They multiplied it by four. And now, every second, about 40 rounds were flying downrange. The Germans had a similar, even more powerful concept with their quad 20 millimeter anti-aircraft cannons, but that was a much heavier system specifically for that anti-aircraft role. The Quad 50, it was way simpler, more versatile, and had an electrically operated turret. You could whip this thing all around and up to 90 degrees upward to get a target in your sights fast. It could be set up on the ground or even mounted on vehicles. And you guys, it wasn't long before someone genius turned the Quad 50 on ground targets, especially later in the war when the Allies gained total air control. So they didn't have to worry much about the Luftwaffe anymore. They were used for infantry support. And trust me, the effect of 450s firing at a single spot is just devastating. This Quad 50 lived on even after the war. It saw combat in the Korean and Vietnam Wars as well. An absolute legend. Okay, so listen to this. It was Carlos Hathcock, the legendary sniper from the Vietnam War, who experimented with an M2 machine gun by mounting a telescopic sight on it. He used it for engaging targets with single shots at long ranges where standard sniper rifles just weren't effective. And he even scored confirmed completions this way. With a scoped M2, let that sink in. This very idea inspired and later LED to the creation of the M82 Barrett. You know, the one, the so-called anti-material sniper rifle chambered in 50 BMG that became famous in the American army. Now, this video about the 50 wouldn't be complete without talking about the ammo. Some seriously interesting rounds were developed, like the Ralph Foss multi-purpose round. This one combined everything in one cartridge. We're talking an armor-piercing tungsten core, plus a small explosive and an incendiary charge. It also creates fragmentation. It basically behaves like a 20 millimeter cannon shell, but in a 50 BMG package. Then there's the slap round, short for Sabot Light Armor Penetrator. And this works a lot like those much larger armor-piercing, discarding sabot rounds that tanks fire. Uh, it has a small uh, subcaliber penetrator made from some seriously dense material. Uh, absolutely insane. Usually tungsten, you know? And it has way better armor penetration while being super effective against light armored vehicles or even helicopters. But here's the thing. These are usually for sniper rifles because it is not a cheap round to fire on full auto. Oh, and yeah, while we're on sniper rifles, 
The 50 BMG cartridge impressed the American military so much that they literally built a sniper rifle around it. The most famous example, a guy named Carlos. Now listen, while the Allies hated German machine guns in World War II for their insane fire rate, the Germans, on the other hand, they hated the incredible power of the M2 Browning and its 50 BMG cartridge. I mean, come on, it didn't get nicknames like Meat Chopper and Crowd Mower for nothing, right? But the real story is actually much darker and, well, as you could imagine, what happens after being hit by a round like that is just gruesome. You saw them on bombers, on vehicles, and of course on tripod mounts for the infantry. And they were effective against almost anything you might run into on the battlefield. At first, its biggest use was on aircraft with lighter barrels and a rate of fire tuned up from around 500 to about 1,200 rounds per minute. Wait, let that sink in. That's almost the same rate of fire as the German MG42. Now, it was only meant for short bursts, and they tuned it up so much because on an aircraft or in anti-aircraft use, you only have a tiny little window of time before your targets are just gone, out of sight, and in some configurations. The M2 reached absolutely absurd levels. For example, you've all heard of the B-17 Flying Fortress Bomber, right? It used M2s for protection against enemy fighters. In the G model, it carried up to 13 of them, mounted in twin setups in all its turrets, the P-47 Thunderbolt fighter bomber had eight of them, four in each wing. And then the Douglas A-26 Invader took this to a whole other level with, listen to this, up to 18 M2s, mounting eight just in the nose, four in each wing and two in the turret. I mean, come on, the M2 immediately proved to be a huge improvement over the lighter 30 caliber machine guns early in the war. It just had that perfect balance, you know, between rate of fire and the raw power of a single round more than enough to bring down a fighter or bomber, it could easily punch right through engine blocks, especially with armor-piercing rounds. And trust me, when you have several of them firing at the same time, it's dangerous for anything on the battlefield. American fighter planes would just strafe locomotives, armored vehicles, and even tanks with incredible effectiveness since the roof armor was always the thinnest part. And very soon, the heavy barrel version became an absolute must-have on almost all tanks and vehicles. And honestly, wherever else they could stick one. By 1945, millions of M2s had been produced, making it the most produced machine gun ever, and you can bet the Germans were getting frustrated. The fact was, American heavy machine guns were simply everywhere on the battlefield. This also made every single attack from a low-flying fighter. Or a dive bomber like the Stuka? So much riskier. Why? Because almost every Jeep, every half-track, and every tank had a 50 cal on it. This is exactly why on tanks, the M2 was mounted on the back of the turret operated by a soldier standing on the engine deck. That way it could fire UP in case of an air attack. Although I'm not gonna sugarcoat this, the gunner was completely outside the relative safety of his tank. Okay, so before we get into the battle action, here's an explanation. In case you ever wondered why a Browning's barrel kicks back after firing, the M2 operates on the short recoil principle. The barrel and bolts start out locked together. After it fires, they move backward as one unit and that keeps the cartridge case supported while the chamber pressure is still insanely high. So it won't rupture when extraction starts. After traveling backwards about 10 millimeters, the barrel stops and the bolt just keeps on moving backward on its own. It extracts and ejects the spent case and as it moves, it compresses the recoil spring, which then shoves the bolt forward again. It grabs a new round from the disintegrating belt, chambers it and fires again, repeating the process for as long as you hold down that trigger. Okay, now let's talk about how the Germans saw these things and why they absolutely hated the 50s for several reasons. The first and most obvious one, the Americans, began relying more and more on just overwhelming firepower as their main tactic, and the Germans, of course, were absolutely terrified by it. Okay, so unlike the Germans, the Americans never had to worry about running out of ammo. And it seemed like, honestly, anything with wheels or wings on that battlefield had at least one heavy machine gun bolted on. I'm not gonna sugarcoat this for you guys. Getting shot at by 50 cows is a completely different ball game than smaller rounds. And the range? They totally outclassed the lighter machine guns. It wasn't even a fair fight. Just look at the difference, right? You've got the eight millimeter Mauser round from the MG42, and then you put the 50 caliber next to it. The 50 is an absolute monster. This thing delivers between five and 10 times more energy than any other infantry weapon, so get this. If you were holed up in a house, forget about it. Those concrete or brick walls, they weren't gonna save you anymore. Those rounds would either punch right through the wall and take you out, or if the first one didn't get you, a longer burst on one spot would do the trick. It would just collapse the entire wall section. 
or completely shred your sandbag bunker. And here's where it gets insane. Even armored tanks like the Panzer IV weren't safe. When hit by heavy 50 cal fire, some of those rounds could actually slip through, especially from the side or the rear, or it could wreck their optics, bust their tracks, or even jam the turret. And you want to talk about the Pacific, those lightly armored Japanese tanks? For example, were knocked out by the 50s easily. I mean, especially when they tried those bonsai charges, which, believe it or not, happened on multiple occasions. You can imagine how surprised the American tankers were, right? They just opened up with everything they had. Now, listen up, because there's this one controversial thing about the 50 in World War II, and that's the myth. Um, the story that it was banned by the Geneva Conventions. Why? Because of its absolutely devastating effect on the human... Okay, so that part was a myth. It wasn't banned. But the effect on the body, trust me, that was not exaggerated. Basically, if you got hit by a 50 anywhere on your body, you were either going to lose that part if you could even survive without it or you were just gone. And let me tell you, a lot of German soldiers were unfortunate enough to witness that firsthand when that 50 BMGs energy transferred. Man, it was just serious, destructive force, of course. But wait, it gets crazier. There were also um, specialized exotic variants, variants that made it even more effective. First up, you've got several versions of armor-piercing rounds. We're talking rounds that could punch through about an INCH of hardened steel. Then you've got incendiary rounds, their whole job to light things on fire, super effective when you're shooting at an enemy aircraft, for example. So not only is its fuel leaking after a hit, but now it could also be easily set ablaze. And then they were like, why not both? So they made armor-piercing incendiaries combining the best of both worlds. And it gets better. Armor-piercing incendiary tracer, like the name says, it adds a tracer so you can see your hits. Again, SO, useful for anti-aircraft fire or, you know, for adjusting your aim at longer ranges. You could literally see where your rounds were landing. And you needed that because the 50 BMG rounds are still deadly effective. Even out to over TWO kilometers. Unbelievable, right? So for the M2, the belts were usually loaded with a mix of rounds with a tracer popping up every fifth round for standard ground combat. Meanwhile, aircraft, they'd load up a wild combination of armor-piercing incendiaries and tracers for dogfights or ground attacks, you know, depending on the job they needed to do. After World War II, the effect this thing had on a target was so intense that we can't even get into the details here. Yeah, because of YouTube, but I'm sure you guys get the picture. If it can do that to a solid wall or a watermelon... Just imagine the damage to a person. So now you can see why the German soldiers were so worried about it, right? They had to completely change their tactics just to deal with American heavy machine gun positions. They stopped doing direct assaults and started trying to take them out with snipers, tanks, or indirect fire from mortars and artillery. And here's the kicker. The Germans had nothing like it. Their heavy machine gun for the war was the MG42 or the MG34, but only when it was mounted on that Lafette tripod. That was their heavy machine gun setup. And don't get me wrong, that Lafette tripod was a genius piece of engineering. It gave their machine guns insane accuracy and better range. But the 8mm Mauser round they were firing, it just had nowhere near the punch of the 50 cal. The absolute closest thing the Germans had was their 13mm heavy machine gun. But get this, they only used it on fighter planes. The Germans even planned to mount captured M2s on their U-boats. Yeah, as anti-aircraft weapons for when they had to surface and charge their batteries. They even started producing their own copies of 50 BMG rounds just for this. That tells you how much they respected this weapon, right? Even though it only actually happened in a few rare cases. Okay, so before we dive into some absolutely terrifying modifications, out of the M2 machine gun, let's get into the different types of rounds they were slinging, okay? The standard one was just your basic ball ammo, a full metal jacket. This beast was the M1921, a water-cooled heavy machine gun meant mostly for anti-aircraft duty. But then they started testing it to see where else it could possibly fit in. And honestly, at first, it wasn't looking very promising. I mean, infantry guys couldn't handle it because it was just too heavy to carry, weighing about 120 pounds in the water-cooled version, or 84 pounds for the lighter air-cooled model. But wait, there's more. The tripod added another 44 pounds. So a complete ground setup was between 130 and 170 pounds, and that's before you add all the ammo, which, trust me, wasn't light either. This was a huge problem. Not to mention it had some serious recoil, making it really tough to fire accurately. The smaller aircraft for the time, 
They couldn't make much use of it either. And for vehicle use, mounted in those early small turrets, also a huge problem because it could only be fed from the left side. So at first its only real use was as an anti-aircraft coastal gun. But here's the thing. No one could imagine just how much everything was about to change. John Browning himself passed away in 1926, but development kept going, you know, his design was refined, they changed up the internal parts, and here's the genius move. The feeding could be quickly switched between left or right. All you had to do was change the top cover. Then, a universal receiver was developed, and on this thing you could mount either a water-cooled barrel with its jacket, a heavy air-cooled barrel, or even a light air-cooled barrel for aircraft use. Now, this concept was starting to look really, really promising. And with a few other small improvements, the gun finally got its official designation, the M2 Browning machine gun. Now listen to this. During this time, other nations were turning to even heavier weapons. We're talking like 20 or 30 millimeter cannons. But the Americans? They believed the 50 caliber's high velocity and its sheer adaptability would still make it super effective. So it stayed in production. And just how effective would it be? Well, the world was about to find out as a new global conflict began. And the M2 turned into the legendary Mod Deuce, the 50 Cal 50, as soldiers would soon be calling it. That's Mod Deuce, in case you didn't know. It was coined from the words mother and deuce, meaning two, kind of like the mother of machine guns. And honestly, it turned out to be pretty close to that. Now, as World War II kicked off, the United States already had M2s serving in a TON of different roles. We're talking fixed aircraft guns, anti-aircraft, Okay, okay, let's pump the brakes and go back. Let me explain. W-H-Y and how the weapon that would become the M2 was even created back in World War I. Everyone realized just how important effective machine guns were, but here's the thing. During that time, machine guns were firing the same exact ammunition as infantry rifles. And as these new wonders of the battlefield started showing up, you know, the first armored planes and tanks, they showed the need for something with a much heavier punch. So listen to this. General John Pershing specifically demanded a new machine gun that could just obliterate these things. Something way more effective than the 30 caliber machine guns they had. And that request? It was given to John Browning, America's most legendary gun designer. He got the requirements, create a new machine gun that would fire a half inch round at a velocity over 2,700 feet per second, which was a huge jump from anything he had designed before. So what did he do? He took his already reliable M191730 caliber water-cooled machine gun and basically just scaled it up to fire a new, much larger cartridge. And get this, that new cartridge was also a scaled-up version of the 30 6 It had a specific request to be rimless for smoother feeding, and they even got some inspiration from the captured German 13.2-millimeter anti-tank rifle cartridge. And that, my friends became the 50 BMG, the 12.7 by 99 millimeter round. They didn't know it at the time, but they had just created one of the most effective cartridges in history, a cartridge that was about to get plenty of use on the battlefield. So after some back and forth, the first prototype was ready for testing and it soon entered production. That's right, the first prototype was ready for testing and it went into production not long after. 